Welcome to Mile High Theology. I'm Broderick Greer, your host. I'm an associate priest at St. John's Cathedral in the heart of Cap Hill in Denver, as you can hear the sirens here. Welcome to Mile High Theology with Kali Fajardo Anstein. We are so excited. I cannot wait to interview Kali tonight. Um, this is just such a treat. I just let her know she's one of my absolute literary heroes. So it's going to be a lot of fun. One piece of housekeeping, if you have any questions, any comments uh, for Kali during tonight's episode, please simply write in the comment section, either on YouTube or Facebook, and those will get to Kali. And actually, um, the text of your question or comment will come up on the screen, the beauty of technology. We'll get started with a prayer. I'll say, I'll introduce our guest and then we'll dive right in. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, we are listening. We are listening for your voice in those who are different from us. We are listening for your voice in those wiser than us. We hear you, we hear your invitation to a more just world, a world at peace, a world not necessarily free from conflict, but free from violence. We hear you in stories told and untold. We hear you in the voice of Kali Fajardo Einstein, one of the great literary heroes of our time. Bless our time together and bless us as we enjoy good fiction. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. I was walking through an independent bookstore in early 2020 when I asked a staff member if she had any good fiction to recommend. Sabrina and Karina, she quickly answered. The author is local. Her work is solid. I'd like to argue that this author's work is more than solid, but I can't quite, quite find the word for what it is. It is weighty without being cumbersome, heavy without being burdensome. It may be like the seven-year-old cousin who still enjoys being carried on your back, a delight. And wow, it might be time for me to practice from time to time with large bags of rice so I'm prepared next time. Tonight's guest is a finalist for the National Book Award, the Penn Bingham Prize, winner of an American Book Award, and the 2019 rece recipient of the Denver Mayor's Award for Global Impact in the Arts. Along those lines, our guest's work has appeared in multiple notable publications and has been translated into numerous languages, which is fantastic because her work is not meant to be hoarded by English speakers. It should be shared as far and wide as possible. Please give a warm Mal High Theology welcome to Kali Fajardo Anstein. Hi, Hello. thank you so much. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is such a treat, such a joy. Um, as you know, really, as soon as I read the first story um, in Sabrina and Karina, I said, I have to find a way to either meet this person or have her on our podcast. And I'm happy to now say that we've been able to do both. Oh, wonderful. I love, and I love the independent bookstore story. I, I was it, was it Book Bar? It was, yes. Okay, I was, oh, thank you so much, Book Bar, <laughs> for bringing <laughs> um, You know, we don't, we don't have any, um, any sponsors of of Malahi Theology except St. John's Cathedral. So I'm always um, a little hesitant to name names, but I Book Bar is definitely a place that we all want to support and we all want to support all of our independent bookstores when we can. It, it, again, it's a pleasure to have you tonight. Um, in her essay, Writing the Color Purple, Alice Walker said that her characters visit her, Kali. How did Dodie, 
Tina, Sierra, Sabrina, Karina, and the others come to you? That that's a great question, and it's a it's a question that I always find a little mysterious to answer. Um, so, you know, growing up and then going through the educational system and taking all these fiction writing classes and English classes we would talk about character development in this way that was very craft oriented, where you're store, sort of building together these people as if they were your own little Frankensteins. Mm -hmm. And that is not at all how they come to me. <laughs> so I really appreciate this question from you. Um, my characters, they, they sort of reveal themselves in different ways and they're all very unique, which is one of the things that I love about all of them is that when I get a new character, I know that I have a new one for life somewhere inside of my mind. Um, one of the more notable ways that a character sort of revealed themselves to me is in the, the story Tell Me, I was actually driving through like the middle of nowhere wilderness and this great fog rolled over the highway. And I was so scared. I was in my early twenties. I had not driven in weather like that before. And I pulled over in my little Grand Prix at this rest stop. And the way that I started to calm myself down is I started to just allow myself to talk. And the voice that came out, it was Tommy and his auntie Nicole from that story. And then I let them talk for the rest of the way home and I got through the fog. And then I got home and I said, okay, I think actually this is a short story. I need to, I need to capture them and write them down. And you know, different characters, they have different kind of emphasis and pull when they, when they do kind of reveal themselves. Dodie is based on my ancestor. I had a great auntie Dodie. And I had been told stories of her life all the time since I was a little girl by the elders in my family. And so Dodie, she sort of existed before I knew that I would become a fiction writer. She was inside my mind. She was in my thought patterns. And I sort of felt her life pulse and this vibrancy. And when I, when that character, when that ancestor of mine came through, I grabbed my, my iPhone and I made a voice memo and I just started recording what, what it sounded like, the way that I was speaking. And I actually got scared the next day because I played the voice memo back and it did not sound anything like my cadence. I had never heard myself sound like that. Wow. So I think in a lot of ways, there's something happening that is deeper than I'm even aware of. And that's been going on a long time in my family with storytelling. And sometimes, you know, they need to be fine tuned. Like after I have them on the page, they don't just come out perfect. I have to go through and fix them up a little bit. But I do have a very, I would call it a spiritual relationship with my characters. I don't know where they come from all the time, but I'm very happy when they reveal themselves to me and I feel so grateful. And even the characters like Monica in the story Cheeseman Park, who mm -hmm. is difficult to deal with and she commits acts of violence herself that I don't, I don't really like being around her. Even that character I do love because she's one of my people. So um, it's, a very, it's a very interesting relationship I have with them and more and more just keep coming. So I hope they, they keep revealing themselves to me the rest of my life because I, I like being able to write about them. And we like being able to read them. So we, we're selfishly wanting the same thing. What, and, and I mean, I guess, you, you know, usually in Christianity, we would call that kind of experience mystical, you know, that, that there is something um, inhabiting us, something that we can hear that we can't see what a I had no idea that that was um kind of your process what a what a special gift that is yeah thank you I think I mean sometimes it is um challenging because I have characters who I can't really turn off as easily and that sounds really mm -hmm. funny, but I'm, sometimes <laughs> you're like you want to take a shower and you want to be done writing for the day and you're like no mm -hmm. we're, not, we're done talking we sat there all day at the desk we're done with each other so <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that question. I love that. I love that. In the book's um, titular short story, The Care Between Karina, the surviving cousin and her deceased cousin, Sabrina, is both tense, tender, and familiar to anyone with a complex family life. And I have a friend who always says there's no such thing as a dysfunctional family. Dysfunctional just means this is how we function. Um, if you would, say a bit about the role of cousins of intergenerational violence and grief in this book's literary universe. 
Yeah, thank, thank you for calling it a literary universe because I think that is something I just started to realize in the past few years that I'm actually writing within a realm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. when I, I was like, yeah, hey, I, I do agree that it is a literary universe. Um, well, first and foremost, family is incredibly important to me. I come from a large family of seven children. I have five sisters and one brother. I have a large multi-generational family that has been in the Colorado region for hundreds and thousands of years in some cases. And I was around just family constantly as a little girl growing up. Mm. And the, the characters, Sabrina and Karina, they're really interesting when I developed them because I myself as the writer, I was going through a lot of the life stages both of the girls are going through. One is trying to get her education and get her, her life off the ground and start working as a cosmetologist. I was in graduate school. I was trying to figure out how am I going to earn money? What am I going to do for a career? And at the same time, I'm still struggling with drinking and alcoholism and binging in much of the same way Karina is. And mm. so for me, when I wrote that story, it was, it was sort of like a healing process emerging the dichotomy within myself. But it also speaks to my relationship with my sisters and my cousins and my family. Mm. When I was a little girl, I was always filled with questions. And a lot of the questions really had no place. <laughs> you, you know, they're the big questions you ask and no one can answer them for you. And one of the big questions I had over and over again is what makes me me and you you? when I'm sleeping in the beds with my sisters and we're taking baths together and we're eating at the table and we're dressing the same and sharing each other's hairbrushes and clothes, why am I me, me and you are you? And so I think cousins and familiar relationships and sisters, all of that runs through my book because I'm trying to understand what is it that makes this character tick compared to this character and how do we end up in this circumstance of fate where we're in this body and not that body? those kinds of questions. So the familial mm -hmm. element, is, it's just the main thread I think that runs through my work. Um, when it comes to violence in my work, which is an unfortunate uh, thing that pops up in pretty much every story, um, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the comments I would get when I was in graduate school, and I started to realize later that maybe this was a little bit gendered, but people would say, oh, your work is so violent. This is so macabre. This is pretty morbid. And I guess, yeah, I mean, if you think about the story of Sabrina and Karina, Karina has been asked to do makeup on her dead cousin at the mortuary. That itself seems violent and macabre. But to me, I had actually met women who had done that kind of thing multiple mm -hmm. times yeah. in my community. <laughs> like That did not seem that odd to me. Um, and so, I wanted to tell stories that really just spoke to what my community was experiencing. And unfortunately, when you are an oppressed people, one of the things that you're experiencing quite often is violence, because violence is one of the ways that the oppressor keeps those of us who are oppressed in our places. So it's just an unfortunate reality, and that's why it's in my work. Um, but I do think that my work, I. I'm actually squeamish when it comes to on-screen violence in movies or television. I'm not capable of watching graphic depictions very often. And I think when I use violence in my work, I'm actually looking for a way out of it. How can mm. we do this so we are no longer committing acts of violence against each other? And I'm also interested in this idea, in my story, Sisters, for example, when Dodie is attacked and there's this great scene of violence in that story, which I was encouraged to remove from my book. In some cases, people are like, this is too much. Wow. I'm, one of my questions is, how, how is violence something that strains us from our humanity while being one of the most human things that we can commit because it's so prevalent within our human cultures? Mm -hmm. So my hope is that as I grow older and as I write more work, I won't have to focus on it so much. But right now, I have a lot to unpack and I have a lot of questions. And unfortunately, violence is centered in a lot of those. Well, and I mean, violence is inescapable, as you were saying, um, in so many different social locations. Um, and, and, and I think artistically, I mean, there's been so much discussion about violence before, where a lot of people come out on the side, and I agree with this, you know, we, we don't depict violence for the sake of violence. We, 
you know, often depict violence as a vehicle in many ways for something else, um, you know, which, yeah. So back to um, your wonderful stories. The, these stories, as you said, they span generations of survival on the lands that we know today as Colorado and New Mexico. Can you speak to us about the tension between memory, ancestry, and the present moment? Yeah, I love I love this question. Um, so my what I spend my days doing is I'm working on a, my next book, and it's set in the 1930s in Denver. And so history has become such a vital component of my daily life that it's this question is just I wake up and I'm like, what? How is history in my life today? So, so thank you for asking mm -hmm. this. Um, one of the one of the reasons that I became a writer is because. I felt culturally invisible, not only in the mainstream when I was flipping through television and looking mm. in magazines, but also locally. Yeah, I would go to school, I would go to the museums, I would go to the, my history classes, and Hispanos, Chicanos from Southern Colorado, Northern New Mexico were not very much part of the curriculum at the time. And I really did not have an understanding mm. of how my ancestors came off of Pueblos in Northern New Mexico, mixed with Europeans, created new people and walked north and then started living in this city that's not very far away from where they originated from. I didn't have an understanding how my great grandfather came from the Philippines and made a life for himself in Denver in the 1920s and 30s and married my great grandmother. I just, I had no idea how all these different kinds of people could have come together. And it was only mm. through learning about history that I started to understand there were political reasons, there were working reasons, there were genocidal reasons, there were all kinds of reasons that were driving this sort of confluence of people that made me and made my storytelling. So right now, I think what's happening in the present moment, I think a lot of truths are being unearthed in a way that mm. some of us have already known, some of us, our parents and we ourselves have gone through the work to understand our history a little bit better. Um, and our grandparents and those before us. But in a lot of ways, this history was violently taken from us. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've become more and more interested in is how white supremacy functions as sort of the ultimate storyteller. Mm -hmm. And that is, we're telling the story that's correct and all these other stories don't matter and they don't mean anything. And these people are not even fully human. Only this story is fully human. And so right now, I think we're realizing that that obviously is not true and it's evil, but now we need to expose ourselves to all this history and all this humanity that was hidden and lost. And so right now in the current moment, I think we're doing a lot of that work and I think we're raising consciousness in this way. Um, my, my short story, I mentioned it before, Sisters. Sisters is set in the 1950s and when I wrote it, I could not think of a single story that was from a Chicana's perspective from the 1950s in Colorado. I couldn't mm. think of anything in literature that had ever been written in that way. And I'm not saying, oh, I'm the first one. I'm saying that this is terrible, that, this, that I couldn't go look through a book and read about women like me generations before. And so right now, I think we're really trying to understand the subjectivity of history and how do we mm. understand that we are not the centers of the universe that there are other people who have other fully embodied historical lives. Yeah, it's a big question and it's one I think about on the daily. No, that's so helpful. I mean, and I, I think also what you're getting at, if I'm misreading you, is the importance of particularity in storytelling, of regional particularity, ethnic particularity, um, context in terms of, you know, who's in charge of a country, who's not in charge, um, how certain people being in charge can force people from a certain land. Um, these these stories are important. They are vital. It, it, it helps all of us decolonize our imaginations, our minds. Um, it, it's so important. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. Um, 
I'm Broderick Greer, host of Mile High Theology, and I am joined by Kali Fajardo Anstein, author of Sabrina and Karina. And if you're joining us in our audience, please um, share any questions or comments that you might have in the comment section as I wrap up um, our interview with Kali. Kali, I am interested in how story, stories like the ones you've crafted in Sabrina and Karina are in some way the anti-January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, insofar as the stories center on personhood, agency, and dignity, and not the hegemony, aggression, and vileness we witnessed just over a month ago. Well, I think going back to this idea of the particular, I think that is one of the ways that we can combat um, this kind of bigotry and hatred and ugliness and chaos. Um, you know, I one of the comments that I get from readers that is probably one of the most moving for me is I will get messages from someone of another gender, another culture, another region, and they will say, I see myself in these women. I feel mm. that pain. I'm thinking differently about the world right now. I'm thinking differently about my relationship with my sister or my mother. It made me call my grandparents and ask them questions. When I receive quite, or when I receive messages and letters like that from people that are completely on a different spectrum of reality than I am, I'm like, that is the power of literature. Literature is showing the humanity mm. and all the spirit, that thing that makes us human and connected to each other. And all great work really has that ability and that's why it's great. I mean, that's why we love it and we know these characters. Um, I think, you know, I think about books that really shaped me like Lost in the City by Edward P. Jones. Um, I think when I had read that book and that book is centered on African-Americans in Washington, DC and they're set anywhere from the nineties, I believe to the 1960s. When I read that book, I had never visited that community but I felt like some of these women characters are like my aunts or mm. people that I had been cousins with. And that that kind of shows me there's this space that literature sort of opens up and it's this common ground where we can all meet each other. And I don't mean like this idea, like let's all work on our differences and form common ground right here. I mean, mm. the human experience is undeniably human. And when you enter that space, you cannot look away from it. You know that this other person outside of you has equal humanity to you. And mm. that's why I love storytelling and why I've given so much of my life over to it. And I just keep, I, I hope I keep doing it <laughs> forever. I, I hope that too. I mean, what a gift. And, and you know, I think a lot of um, gatekeepers, if you will, of literature, and I, I'm not sure if you've encountered this, but I've just encountered it in conversations and watching people talk, are, are like allergic to particularity. They think that um, dominant hegemonic narratives are um the norm and that if if a story is not about you know a white straight man basically um then they cannot identify with the with the character or with the story and it sounds like what you're getting at is that even if a story is very particular it can also it also has space and room. It's spacious enough to accommodate kind of a natural response of empathy. Yeah, I love I love the idea of it being a physical room. Like, welcome to the room. Yes. It's a place in here. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is that you know I grew up reading Harry Potter and books mm -hmm. about white men doing all kinds of white men things all over the world and. I was able to kind of see myself in those stories. I was a little, little bit that wizard boy. And that that like reverse does not happen as often when a white man picks up a book written by say, Kali Fajardo Einstein. And so they're mm -hmm. always I get these surprise messages and things. Like, oh, I can't believe I identify with this. And it's like, well, of course, that's because you, you've been welcomed into the realm of the particular. Mm -hmm. that we <laughs> Welcome into the room for the of the particular. I think that's a book of essays that, that you'll write eventually. 
Um, so if we have any questions from our audience, it looks like we haven't had any. It looks like Kali has just covered everything. So we might not have any questions, but we, we will pause for a moment and take any questions or comments. I'm a priest, so I can sit in silence for a really long time. <laughs> That was one of the things we learned when I was teaching. It was like when you ask your students a question, don't don't give up. Let them let them answer. <laughs> Sit through the uncomfortable silence. Exactly. Oh, you got one question from Connor, who asks, "I'm curious where you would say one might find God in your stories and in the lives of your characters." That is a big question. <laughs> that is a big question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that room of the particular, but <laughs> I think sometimes I'm actually surprised by um, my character's faith. And that is, you know, I grew up Catholic. I grew up with indigenous ceremonies and customs as well. And I, I'm always shocked that my characters truly, they truly pray and they they're connected to each other and they miss going to church and they have this deep connection in a way that I myself as the writer didn't know I actually had. So they sometimes, mm. they remind me a little bit <laughs> about where I can find God in my own work. And I, that, that is such a gift that my characters give me, you know, sometimes, you know, I think of Tell Me, that story I mentioned earlier. Nicole, in that story, she begins sort of in a confessional mode as if she's gone to confession. And she's saying, this is what I've done. These are all the things that I've done to my family. And I, I sort of felt when I finished that story, it was the whole story of her trying to find forgiveness. And I thought, wow, this is a very God godly story I wrote. I didn't know if I had that kind of, mm -hmm. kind of impetus in me. but. I do think it's um, in a lot of the conversations too that my characters have with their family members and with each other. Um, there are moments where they teach me so much and I feel like that's something coming down. Wow. I love that. And I, I think, you know, I'm an Episcopal priest. And so we, even within kind of the Episcopal or Anglican tradition, there is this sense that you know god is not necessarily separate from a story like god is is kind of everything that's making up the story and and i i mean just reading your work every character every um encounter every scenario just is like packed full of the divine in such an unmistakable way that's not even necessarily um, something I can articulate. It's just such, it's it's just a feeling. It's very, ob you know, it's not, not, it's obvious and subtle at the same time, um, which is such a gift. Well, that is very beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Perfect. Oh, Michael McKee, one of our members at St. John's. Michael says, allergic to particularity is similar to Christine Meek's statements and dialogues. She asked the question, what are you willing to give up to arrive at a beloved community? And that sounds more like a comment if I'm interpreting that correctly, Michael. Uh, but what a great. Oh, the Meek's question is that what you expect your characters to answer. Um, <laughs> is the question, what do I expect my characters to answer? What would they be willing to give up to arrive at community? I or, think so. Or is it, what would I expect them to answer me? Oh, okay. Evan says yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think that is, a, that is an excellent question. And I think my characters, 
So when you're when you're writing fiction and you're learning how to do it, one of the things that they teach you in fiction writing school is your characters have to want something. They always have to want and desire something. And I always mm. found that a little bit tricky because a lot of my characters don't really come from societal positions where they can have very big wants. Their wants are mm. I want a shelter, I want to have a job next week, um, I want my cousin to be alive again. You know, so I didn't have I never had the sense of what what exactly do they want, but I did have a sense of what they were giving up in order to grow. And there, I mean, some people might say that my stories don't have a traditional epiphany or there isn't traditional growth arc throughout the story, but I really disagree because in all of my stories, they're learning something about themselves. And oftentimes they have to give up sort of an, a vanity that they have, something that is selfish that is serving as a as a means of destruction and mm. so i i mean i can think of examples in you know marion or julian plaza actually they called it its real name <laughs> and julian mm -hmm. plaza, that story um the father is stealing to essentially pay for his wife's his wife's cancer care and mm -hmm. That was a moral dilemma that I was I was interested in putting inside the story because I wanted to see how he would work around it as a character. And ultimately, when he lost the ability to pay for her care through stealing, he also lost the ability to have her on earth in some ways. And so one thing that he was clinging to was this material, these material objects that he was taking. Um, and I do think about my characters in terms of their gestures are rooted in realism, but to me, they're also symbolic gestures across the board. Mm. And so often you will see characters in my stories are stealing. They are, they're thieves. <laughs> they, they steal a lot and they have to give up that kind of behavior in more ways than one. So I think that's a really interesting question and I hope I answered it somewhat mm. near the area where you were going with it. <laughs> Thank you. What a gift. Yeah, and I, I think too, and I guess in some ways related to Michael's question, you know, beloved community is often this thing that we think about external to ourselves. Um, and it sounds like your, your characters are doing that internal work before they're able to begin kind of doing that external work of, of beloved community. Yeah. I, I think that's, primarily why I started writing is I, I had a lot of internal work that I, mm -hmm. I wanted to do. And I wanted to see how other types of beings were doing that kind of internal work. Amazing. Well, Kali, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to our audience for your great questions and your engagement tonight. Um, and Kali, if you ever want to come back on Mile High Theology, you always have a place here. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, God bless you. White supremacy is a failure of imagination. Every time I speak to a black indigenous or artist of color, I realize this anew, that the stories of domination, unrestrained entitlement and manifest destiny are not humane or even necessarily natural. And yet, those are the stories that get the most attention, space, and airtime. If you are listening to this podcast or watching, you have the joyful task of not only telling better stories, but creating better stories with better heroes and imagination enough to empathize with the crucified instead of the crucifiers. Malhai Theology is a production of St. John's Cathedral and Episcopal Church in Denver, Colorado. To financially support the work of Malhai Theology, visit sjcathedral.org forward slash give. That is sjcathedral.org forward slash give. I offer special thanks to our guest, Kali Fajardo Anstein, our communications director and producer, Evans Owsley, our cathedral administrator, Georgie Brooks Myrtle, our theme music composer, 
Noah Glenn, and you, our loyal listeners. This podcast was recorded on the land of Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We give God great thanks for the 48 contemporary tribes that are historically tied to the lands that make up the contemporary state of Colorado. Join us on Monday, March 8th, when a representative of Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains speak to, speaks to us for a special Women's History Month episode of Malhai Theology. Please rate and review Malhai Theology on Apple Podcasts to enhance our digital visibility. Thank you. God bless you. See you next month. <laughs>